Okay, so um, uh, I'm Dave. Uh, good evening. Um, I I've been working on this uh, Scala three Scala JS scheme engine for more years than I care to admit. Um, uh, and um, what I made it, it was kind of like a. Um, I, I, I was previously a Flash developer, and I really enjoyed making like fun and pretty things. And I ended up doing Scala by mistake. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I quite liked it, and I liked all the functional programming stuff. I liked the um, reusability, pure functions, the sort of um, the, the I'd never previously seen um, systems that were sort of reasonable that you could kind of understand as what they were doing. And I thought there must be a way of doing this stuff in in uh, Scala, right? But as it turns out, nobody was really doing any of that. So I kind of did a if I build it, maybe other people will come along. Um, and uh, maybe they'll do a better job than me and I can use their stuff. But nobody's turned up to do that so far. Um, but some people have turned up. Uh, <clears throat> some people, there's kind of a, one group of people that's turned up are people who already know what they're doing. Right? They don't really need me. They turn up on our Discord server and kind of chat and occasionally post really cool screenshots, which is awesome. Um, and then there's another group which are a bit more quiet and they are a bit like, yeah, I don't really know where to start. Um, I'd like to have a go, but I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, so I, this talk is really for them, right? I'm trying to um, find a way for back-end engineers and data people to build games. Um, so as a back-end and data person, uh, once you've got over the initial disappointment that you may, on your own, not be able to build the next version of Grand Theft Auto, um, <laughs> you might start thinking, well, what would be reasonable criteria for me just to start learning the domain? Because it is completely different to what we do at work. It's, to, it's a totally different area. Um, and uh, I, I think sooner or later you end up trying to avoid the art. Right? So you kind of avoid, like, oh, I don't really want to do too much graphics. Maybe I want to do too much audio. Even game design is art. Right? And so you inevitably end up thinking, well, maybe I'll learn how to do this by doing things like classic arcade games. Right? Or maybe if you're slightly more academic, maybe you go for Conway's Game of Life, like a simulation kind of a thing. You see a lot of those kind of tutorials around, right? Um, and these are great. They're really good ways to learn how to make games. You, if you try and build one of these, you'll have to deal with all the problems that you, uh, that the original authors had, which are quite interesting. Um, but the main problem with them is nobody really cares, right? I built Snake more times than I care to, care to admit to. And uh, every time I show it to somebody, they're like, oh, Snake, you get like three seconds of pure nostalgia, and then they move on because they're not interested anymore. They're more interested than the code. So we need something slightly better criteria, right? Um, so we still want that top stuff, um, but we also want um, you know, a game archetype that can scale, something that we can start really small, but we can grow it absolutely enormous if we want to. Um, we want something with lots of programming fun in it. We're programmers. We want to have a good time programming. Where is the programming fun? And the other thing is, we also want a great community, right? <clears throat> um, that is not just people who want to play your game, unlike the snake example, right? Some, but, and people will give you feedback and stuff, maybe even spend money on it, who knows? Um, but also a community of builders, right? I mean, we, we are a community of builders. Um, and if I want to know why I'm on our Dismonoid in the category of anger focus, I'm sure every single one of you can tell me. Um, but if I want to know how to build a really good combat system or procedural dungeon generation, mm, maybe not, right? So we need some, we need some people to help us a lot. Um, my proposal for this is a genre called uh, roguelikes, which I'm not suggesting everybody here is going to enjoy. Right? I'm suggesting you might enjoy making them rather than playing them. You might enjoy playing them as well. Lots of people do. Um, it's not. I don't think it's reasonable to suggest that. Uh, you know, just because you really love a certain genre of game, you're going to actually be good at making it, right? You know, you know, are you going to be good at making multiplayer first-person shooters? Who knows? Um, but I'm suggesting world life is in staff called back engineers and data people. Um, so what is roguelike? like? Well, oh, come on. Did you move your phone? You I moved did. Your phone. I want to take a photo. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Don't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> uh, sorry about that, folks. Right. So this is this is the original roguelike. Uh, this is Rogue from 1980 in all of its ASCII glory. Isn't it beautiful? Um, the general premise of roguelikes is uh, you walk around a procedurally gener generated dungeon in ASCII. There will be more ASCII to come. Don't you worry. Um, and you collect stuff, and you fight bad guys, and you die repeatedly. 
And when you die, it's called permadeath, which I found really off-putting at first. I was like, you die completely? You can't come back? What is that about? Um, and then I kind of, I don't know if the roguelike community will thank me for saying this, but I started thinking about, about it being a bit like chess, you know, like you play through to the end of the game of chess. You, if you're me, you lose because I'm not very good at it. And then hopefully if you play it again, although your chessboard is exactly the same as it was last time you played, maybe you're a little bit better at it. You know, maybe you as a person, a player are better, and maybe next time you'll discover more things, right? So the pleasure of these things is in the mastery, right? Um, let's look at a couple of... Come on. There we go. We're going to look at a couple of roguelikes. Um, if it keeps up with me, come on. Um, these are commercial roguelikes, in quotes. I don't know if this is working now. <laughs> I am up to the point. I know, I know. I'm sick There it is. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, right, we'll keep going and hope for the best. Um, so this is, you can't talk about Roblox without mentioning Dwarf Fortress. Uh, Dwarf Fortress has been in development for like 20 years. It's really intimidating. Like they generate thousands of years of history before you even start playing. They're kind of thinking, what do you do with that? It's too much for me. Lots of people love it. Um, the next one, if it ever loads, there we go, thank goodness, is uh, Hoplite. This is much more my speed. Uh, this is a little mobile game. You can get it for free. I highly recommend that you do. Um, it's uh, very highly thought of. And this was the game that really made me get the genre, because I was kind of playing it and going, yeah, yeah, it's a game, you know. And then I walked away, and I came back, and I accidentally did something different, and something else happened, and I kind of went, oh, there's more tactics here that I hadn't previously appreciated. OK, so the fun is in the, is in the last room. Um, this isn't going to go well at all. <laughs> this is Cogmind. Honorable mention goes to Cogmind. This is still pretty much ASCII, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and if you play it full screen, it's a little bit like playing in the Matrix. Um, it's, the other thing is this guy uh, who made it. You'll notice all the teams here are like one and two people. Right? So this is very achievable for solo devs. Um, and like I say, these are commercial. There's some value of commercial. Um, so the guy who makes this, Josh Gee, he sort of, I hope I it correctly, he turns up all over the place uh, doing the roguelike dev subreddits and running some of the events and stuff like that. <clears throat> but what I like about this one is he spent a lot of time on usability and accessibility, you know, because not in the sense that um, most roguelikes are ASCII, they're hard to understand, they, they have to use a keyboard and know what all the keys are, but this, this is very kind of usable. You can just use a mouse and drag and drop things and, and click where you want to go. Um, I also wanted to mention pork like verst of the verst, first things to verst. Um, <coughs> um, mostly, I just want you to look at the graphics and try and keep it in mind for later. Um, there is a whole YouTube series on how the guy made this. It's got the Pico 8 um, and how he did the graphics and stuff. Remember the graphics for later. Okay. Right. So, while holding a microphone, I'm going to attempt to make a bit of a rope like. Um, but first, um, so. We're going to be using Indigo, of course, and we're going to be using um, the roguelike starter kit, which is like the only official extension to Indigo. And what it does is, Indigo is a pixel art game engine. The roguelike starter kit, kit gives you terminal emulation-like behavior, so you can try and render terminals, right? What is that thing? Okay. Um, this is, I said earlier there was going to be no art. This is all of the art, right? So the pink magenta color is a mask color. Um, otherwise, this is the standard IBM code page 437, extended ASCII edition, um, which is a lovely name. There's loads of variations of this you can get on the Dwarf Fortress repository, and the roguelike starter kit just knows what to do with it, right? So, uh, we're going to make this. Uh, let's have a go. Right, this is going to be a bit difficult. I'm going to be picking this up and putting it down. Bear with me. Uh, also, I'm using Mill today for no particular reason. It's just Propaganda, because I want you all to try and mill. Okay, so um, Indigo comes with um, plugins, um, which. Ooh. No. That's, that sounds like a terrible idea. Okay. Um, yeah, so Indigo comes with plugins that makes uh, running your games in Electron trivial. Indigo is ScarJS. ScarJS is absolutely amazing. You can run it on just about anything. Um, and for now, what we've got is this sort of Hello World 
beginning point, right? Here we go again, hold on. The good news is they made me do this last time and I've simplified it since then. So this is a really basic integral thing, right? <clears throat> um, we'll walk through it quickly. Uh, basically, this is what's called, um, there's, there's different, what are called entry points. Uh, this is the sandbox one, it's the simplest one, it's for demos and stuff like this. Um, you have to give it a few basic parameters, like do you have assets in config? Yes, you do. Um, and the rest of it is the L architecture. Um, the way the L architecture works is it's very simple. You have a big, full blob of data, and that is your model, right? You may also have a view model. In this case, it's just a model in the sandbox. Um, and you have a pure function that uh, turns that model into the next version of the model, right? Based on some events and some, some other peripheral context data, like what time it is, right? Um, and then after that, you take your model and you render it uh, into what's called a, an outcome and a scene update fragment. So, outcome, so a scene update fragment is basically a description of the things you want to draw, right? Or audio as well, you know, all that kind of stuff. The outcome type is, um, it's a little bit like try or something like that. It's good for capturing errors. Cap holds a value, but also its main, fo its main focus is um, uh, it stores ordered events, right? So you can, through the process of uh, running your update or, or your rendering or whatever it is, you collect events of uh, things that you want to do, and they get passed back to down to the down to the runtime, and they come back on the next frame. So there's no mid-frame event processing at all. So you, so you can you basically you can run an actual unit test of your presentation or your update function because it's just a pure function, right? Um, okay, so one thing I have done here is I've threaded a model through the type parameters. I'm going to be a bit careful because when I move, that moves about five seconds later. Um, so we have a model. Let me just go and show you the model. And right now it's incredibly simple. It's not going to get much more complicated. Um, all we've got is a player, which is represented by a point. Indigo is a pixel art game engine, so it's integer-based, right? There are other types for managing uh, uh, sort of double types and stuff like that for doing physics and things. <coughs> uh, and then we have a, uh, a room, which is a rectangle. And I also set up the floor, which is the room, but contracted in all directions by one pixel, okay? Right, so if we comment our color world, uh, what we're gonna do, first of all, is we're gonna fill so, sorry, sorry, we're going to use a, uh, the, the rogue terminal emulator. There's two terminal emulators in the start kit. One is the well-behaved and uh, immutable and, and nice terminal emulator. And then there is the um, boisterous cousin, uh, the rogue terminal emulator, which is mutable, and you have to be a bit more careful with it, but it's much, much faster. So I'm using that one today. <clears throat> so first of all, we're going to fill the whole screen. Um, then we're going to render the floor which is that floor value from the model, sort of sunk in by one. And then at the end, I'm gonna stick the player. Um, the tile variables and everything come from the starter kits. And this is one of those roguelike things that you just kind of have to know. Commercial at is the hero, okay? Okay, so if we render that, sorry, run that. Ooh, okay. There we go. Oh, come on. There we go. Right, so um, currently it doesn't do anything, but it is rendering something that we might be interested in. Right. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is move the thing around. Um, and this all happens in a function called bump. Right, so bump is basically the whole game. Right, what we're going to do is we're going to say, somebody's pressed an arrow key, they've wanted to move in one direction, did they hit a wall, was it a door, do I open it, do I beat it up, was it a bad guy, do I collect it, what was it? The whole game is the bump function, right? And all we have to do to collect the events is um, listen for, during our update function, which is a function from global event to um, an outcome of the model, um, listen for the relevant keyboard events and pull bump with a relative position. So all we're saying in the, in the bump function is, what's the next relative position? Uh, does the floor contain the player plus that? If it does, 
carry on, just stick that onto the player and, and replace it. And if not, don't change the model. And if you do that, you get eventually So, we get this, and um, we can move on to the around. That was easy. Okay. Back to the presentation. So, that works. Um, kind of, we've kind of got something. You can move it around. It's kind of interesting. Not. Um, to make it a game, all we have to do now is add all of this stuff. non play characters, levels, path by new blender generation, collectibles, combat mechanics, health, damage, health, potions, inventory, puzzles. Menus and field of view and more, many more things. And clearly, I'm not going to get through that in the next 20 minutes. Um, so this is the point where I get to hand you over to that community I mentioned earlier. Um, this is going to sound like a cop out. Bear with me. So the roguelike community, they have, they actually have an official set of tutorials, which is that link in the middle, which will teach you everything you need to know about making a roguelike. Yes, it is in Python, so you will also learn how to skim read Python, which is a bonus. Um, but apart from that, it's actually it's really good and quite in depth. The, um, the Roguelike Dev subreddit, which is run by that guy I mentioned earlier, Josh, um, they do, every year they do a, uh, they do the complete Roguelike tutorial. It's a bit like those book clubs you do at work, where you kind of every, every week, um, you know, you turn up, and this, but this time they get to see screenshots as well as, uh, as well as compare notes. Um, they also have a Roguelike celebration, which is a conference. Um, some of the talks are really good. I've heard nothing but good things about that. Um, and they also have game jams. The next one is like next week. If anybody wants to enter, no pressure. Um, this is the seven day roguelike challenge. Uh, you get seven days to melt to make all, to make all these. The, the rules are on the website if you're interested. Um, so there's lots of people, and, and again, lots of people will compare notes and talk about what they're doing. And, uh, there are people who do the, uh, the follow along every single year, well known games programmers who will, who will go in and do it every year and they'll try and do it in different ways to see what happens. It's, it's good fun. Um, and I did it a few years ago. There we go. Um, this is uh, in an earlier version of Indigo, and uh, this is me trying to follow the tutorial. Um, and so I must admit, I, I, I did it because somebody talked me into it, not because I had a sort of personal interest at the time. Um, and uh, if you want to, you can go and look at the code. The code's absolutely awful. It's the, it's the you know, illegitimate child of mutable Python and uh, immutable Scala. Um, <clears throat> but at the end, I was like, this this kind of interesting. Like it looks terrible here. I I grant you that. Right? But if you play it, it's like you know, this it works. Kind of flows. It's kind of interesting. And, I was, and, and my question then was, well, now what? And that's kind of what I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about, not how to build a world like. Um, and this is my attempt to do an ASCII art joke. Um, the elephant in the room is that I can't tell it's an elephant because it's a silly ASCII character, right? I know it's terrible, right? But um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say here is, like. These things are not necessarily, they can look really cool, but they're not necessarily friendly, right? Like people just turning up and trying to play them, it's quite difficult, right? Um, and what I wanted to do is they figure out if it was possible to make this something that my daughter, who is seven, could play, right? So, we're going from the thing on the left to the thing on the right, okay? I'm going to try and play this. I don't have much hope. <laughs> this is going to work. Is that going to work? Yeah, kind of. Right. Um, the lag is the lag is killing me. So I put rainbows in it because she likes rainbows. Um, what I was trying to do is work out if it's possible to make something which is kind of more aesthetically appealing. I won't run. I normally try and run this, but I won't run it now. Um, the as you can see, the, so these are the same game, right? They're the same model, pretty much, right? Um, the first one is 181 lines of code, and the second one is five times that, and all of that is kind of embellishment. Right, to make it pretty and usable. Right? Now, the thing on the left is something that lots of people will actually be quite happy to play. I mean, not that game, but ASCII art games in general. They're quite happy to play them. Um, that's what the world community is built on. I like pixel art, so I've kind of gone for the one on the right. right? Uh, shall I run it? No, I, won't. I don't trust the connection. <laughs> OK. So, um, our aim, yeah, so our aim is to inform and immerse the players. What we want to do is find ways, little tricks, to make the game more readable at first glance, so that even my, my daughter can look at it and go, oh, I know what to do. 
right? So we're going to go through, we're gonna, this is going to be broad, not deep. Uh, we're going to look at some quick wins. We're going to talk about how lighting works. Um, we're going to talk about animation and functional programming, um, bit of term management, and then finally, uh, one of my favorite subjects is shapes, which we will also do in Scala 3. So, quick wins. Um, the first thing is, there isn't any more graphics. I know it looks different, but it's the same sheet being rendered in a very similar way. So I've drawn over the top of it. Think back to pork-like. You don't have to go this far, right? Or you can go even further than this, of course. I've just had to do things faster. You can go further. You can also keep it simple, and it's still really cute and interesting. Um, so swap the tile sheets. The next thing is um, rethink how the rendering works a little bit, right? So on the left, we have what happens if you simply render that tile sheet using the process we looked at earlier, right? And uh, the, the main character, as you can see, is kind of is in the grid, right? So what we do instead is lift him out, render the background as one terminal, right? So that just happens in the background. Um, that puts the character on the grass. You can change that little white crossy thing is supposed to be what's called a reference point, where you're basically saying to Indigo, hey, when you render this thing, render it slightly offset, right? And that makes it look like it's kind of standing in the middle of the square, not part of the square. Then you stick a little circle underneath it, and all of a sudden he's got a little bit of weight, right? So it doesn't take a lot, but little refinements, and you end up with something a bit cuter. Um, and the final quick win is sound, and it's quick in Indigo because I'm not a sound engineer, and I don't know how to do that. So what I've done is I've kept, I've kept it really simple. We've got um, what I talked about earlier is the outcome type, where you're adding global events, and one of those is um, player sound asset, right? Which is just a name that you've given it that's come through the. Uh, through the Indigo plugin. The plugin will do things for you, like read your asset directory and turn it onto Scala code for you, so you don't have to think about doing that yourself. Um, and then uh, the bottom part is uh, uh, scene audio. So this is background music. If you want to play tracks, you can, you can do stuff like that too. Uh, and, and sound really does add quite a lot to the game. Um, mm -hmm. Mood lighting. Um, can you see that on that screen? Kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, I don't know if this is really necessary in this demo, but I put it in because I wanted to show you how it works. Right? What I thought I would try and do is use some lighting to kind of guide your eye towards the exit. Right? Um, so uh, to make lighting work, first of all, we have to change the way the textures are set up. So initially, all we have is this thing on the left. This is what's known as a diffuse texture. It's the basic color in the background. Um, I then drew, basically, I copied the image three times. Sorry, two more times. And the first thing I did was I did what's called an emissive. And the emissive is, I just drew like the whites of the eyes, because what it basically means is, regardless of what lighting is going on, that's going to be what color that is. Right? So it looks like when you're standing in the dark, you can still see the eyes, which I thought was a little bit creepy, but fine. Um, the next one is a height map. <clears throat> you don't use height maps directly, but you can draw them quite trivially yourself. Um, and then I was kind of using a little online tool just to convert that into a normal map. Normal maps are, if you think back to your high school physics, where you learned about um, light angles of instance and reflection, they bounce around a thing called a normal. What the normal map does is it encodes into the image the bend on the normal. So when the light angle comes in, it, bends, it jumps off at a different angle and makes it look like it's bumpy. Right? To use those, we have our little graphic, and we do a, a material modify um, to provide a lighting model. The light, so it's already got the diffuse color in it. The lighting model comes with the emissive and the normal, um, and that, that tells them to go what to do with the whatever it sees uh, to light lights. Um, then finally, we have to add some lights. So what I went for is a great big point light in the middle, um, a direction light, and an ambient light in the bottom corner, which the bottom left corner, which is giving us our sort of base level of lighting, and a little point light over the exit. And you actually add them in code by doing that. So you just say Scene update fragments empty with lot of fun. Or be empty in your case, with lights, stick in a batch of lights. Um, Indigo uses a type called batch rather than uh, list because it's basically much more performant for constructing lists. It's based on um, JS arrays. Uh, list in Scala.js is very, very slow. OK. Um, animation. So, um, th this is kind of where I first got interested in all this to some extent. This is, this, by the way, this is my. Um, this is my little naked dude. Um, I, I made him when Indigo first started. He's been with me the whole time, and I always meant to give him clothes, but I'm now at the point where I quite like his stride. 
this little strut. Um, it's, it's, yeah. So the, there was a there was a paper that came out of Microsoft in 1996 called um, Functional Reactive Animation, and it talks a lot about it's it's where FRP came from. Um, Indigo does not do FRP because it's L architecture and they are different. But I borrowed, I stole lots of ideas from that. Um, the simplest part of this is um, animation is a deterministic function from time to a value, right? Um, it's as simple as that. Scrub down your favorite movie, get to one hour 15, you will always see the same frame. If you don't, it'll be a really weird movie, right? Um, but in programming, of course, we don't have to just, so in the bottom, we really are getting to frames. But we don't have to do that. It can be anything. So the thing in the middle is supposed to be like a little crossfade for audio, maybe, right? A little, little graph. Um, the basic type of doing animations is a type called signals, which is literally that. It's time to a value. And if you look in the bottom left there, we have a little retry. Actually, I'll show you, there. I'll show you it at the end. Um, we have a little, little retry thing when you die. <clears throat> and it um, pulses every half a second. Um, what I'm actually producing there is text, where I'm producing a string. Um, and at the end, it says uh, at, and you give it the context running time. We don't care exactly when that animation starts. right? So there's no state to be held here. We can just say, give me the current time. I'll decide if I'm showing it or not. Right? There's a lot of pre-made uh, signal types that are available. Right. Right. Sorry, sorry. The rest of the button's too enthusiastic. Right. Um, this is another signal. Um, this is a linear signal that goes from 0 to 1. And uh, this one is being used um, with a blend effect. So when you die, um, you are killed, and the whole thing goes black and white. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do here, though, was make sure that animation only starts when you actually die, right? rather than the other one, where, where we don't care exactly um, when the animation starts. Here, we need some state. So the state here is the running, the, the running time minus the time of death, which we have to hold somewhere in our model. Okay? Um, and in uh, Indigo and Yellow Architecture, you have to hold your own state for just about everything. It's just part of the design. Um, signals can be, to make it a little bit easier to work with signals, you can use these uh, things called signal functions, which are basically combinators. Combinators are just um, functions that take functions and return functions. In this case, they take a signal, which is a time to a value A, and produce another signal, which is a time to a value B. Um, and what you can do is you can compose them, as I'm doing at the bottom. So the example here is um, the first function is a little move thing. So it takes a, a, a circle shape, and it produces a signal function, which takes a vector 2 and another circle, and it moves it depending on what the vector is. Um, then we have an orbit signal function, so a bit another built-in one. You just tell it what the radius is and uh, where you want it to go from. And at the bottom, we are piping the time signal into orbit, which is then composed, that funny triple arrow is just and then, um, which is composed into the move function. Okay, So that's not bad, but it's a bit of a pain to describe complicated animations like that. We've kind of got up one level of abstraction. Better could be better still. Better still is we have a DSL, uh, which I'm not illustrating terribly well in this slide. I apologize. But I am using it um, for the movement in the, the character movement in the game. So. The way the DSL works is it allows you to express, oh, I want an animation that's going to start after a certain period of time. It's going to do a piece of animation. I can pause for a bit, do something else, and then I can display the last frame until I've had enough of it, or I can get rid of it completely, whatever I want to do. If you're trying to do something like, I don't know, menu screen graphics or um, a game over screen, it's really handy to be able to express things in terms of um, a sequence of events. And you can, you can also you can see there's a layer in there. You can have multiple layers of animation running at the same time. Okay, and it's all built on top of signals and signal functions. There's a there's a signal function. Um, turn management. So, um, one of the things that happens when you add animations is that things get really complicated, right? So here was this was our ASCII game, and uh, if you remember from the little demo at the beginning, we had the bump function, and I kind of said, like the whole game is the bump function, right? And when everything happens at once, that is true. Um, so our whole game loop looks like wait for the player to hit an arrow key, bump, instantly update everything, including the bad guys, go back to one, sit there and wait for another input. Um, unfortunately, when you add animation, it, it turns into this. Um, wait for the player input, 
update the game, but it's the player's turn. Then you animate the player. Then you update the game again based on the bad guys. Then you animate them, and then you go back to one. And that's actually more difficult to coordinate than something which is happening in real time where everything moves at once, right? Um, it's, it's actually quite a faff. <laughs> so we need to be able to do um, state management, and uh, for that we are using uh, state machines. I'm going to quickly show you how the state machine works in Indigo. OK, I'm just going to show you what it's doing first. Whoa, is there anything more reminiscent of state than traffic lights? Right? So every time, every time I press space, all it's going to do is move to the next state, eventually, and uh, I'll go around and around and around. That's it. Um, so quite often when people say they're going to talk about state machines, they instantly complicate things by talking about um, phantom types, and I'm not going to do that. Um, so what we have here is a very simple model, which has um, a traffic lights in a minute, um, which is red, amber, and green. We have next uh, function, and all that does is if it's red, goes amber. If it's amber, goes green. If it's green, goes red. Um, and then we have a game event at the bottom. Um, and the way the game works, so based on the state, in terms of the rendering, based on the state, we manufacture a crop. I can show you the actual asset. This is it. Right, so it's one big sheet. Um, <clears throat> so we, we work out what the crop should be. I've just hard coded it. Um, and then uh, we apply a crop to our graphic. Every, every type of entity in Indigo has a, um, a sort of series of exciting trade offs that it's making to give you different kinds of effects, right? Because it, every, everything in the games is, is trade offs. Graphics, party pieces that you can crop the images that you're looking at. Um, yep, yeah, so we give it a crop. Uh, in order to actually do the state change, it's very, very simple. When we press space, so I've kind of done it this way. I'll come back to that. Um, when you press the space bar, we add a global event, which is our next state event. On the next frame, this thing will be picked up, and we do model.next. That's our next version of our model. Nothing complicated about that. Um, the reason, clearly, I could have just put this thing here, right? And the reason I haven't is because it's supposed to be representative of well, actually, I've got an awful lot more game logic than this, and I'm, I'm three classes down and a few modules in, and I need to tell my game back at the top to do something different and to, and to make a different decision. Um, yeah, but that's kind of all there is to it. Careful which button you press. Okay. Um, right, last thing I wanted to cover quickly is, uh, just because they're really interesting, is shaders. Um, so you may not have so you may have noticed that there was a rainbow in the in the little animation I showed at the beginning. And there was an enormous amount of debate in my household with my daughter about whether that's the right order of colours for a rainbow. Um, I'm wrong, of course, and I, but I was going for high contrast. Um, so there was no rainbow on the tile sheet though, right? And that's because uh, I could have just put one in there. Of course I could, but then I couldn't talk about shaders. Um, uh, we're doing it with a shader. Um, what on earth is a shader? Well, specifically, we're talking about fragment shaders. There's a, there's a few different kinds. In, in WebGL, there's only two kinds. There's vertex shaders and fragment shaders. Um, a fragment shader, this is a bit of a lie, right? But I want you to think of it as being like a parallel map of all the pixels on the screen, where we run a pure function, we work out what color it should be, right? That's wrong subtly on many levels. But it's good enough for you to understand what we're talking about today. Um, so you get a bit of context. It's a bit like a reader in some ways. You get a bit of context. You get some coordinates, and you have to decide what color you're going to do with a basically a pure function. Um, so let's look at a very simple shader. It was ambitious to try and do that with one hand. Right, so here we have some uh, a simple shader which is rendering some lovely indigo-like colours. Um, trying to keep things on brand, at least for a moment. 
And this is our program. So this is using um, uh, a library called uh, Ultraviolet, which is a um, Scala 3 so GLSL transpiler, right? And it's, it's, it's a great big macro, and it takes Scala 3 and it spits out um, stuff that the graphics card can understand. Um, and the entire program, if you ignore all of this, this is using a different entry point called um, Indigo Shader, which is for um, fiddling about with stuff like this. Convenient for you while you're working out your program. Um, the entire program is actually just this bit, right? All I've really said here is, look into the environment, this is the context I mentioned earlier, grab the UV, which is a VEC2, and we're going to manufacture a VEC4. VEC4s are XYZW, but they're interchangeable with RGBA, right? So here we're doing um, the R and the G are being of coordinates, blue is going to be 100%, and, uh, and the alpha is 100 as well. But if I ditch that bit, so I've got rid of the blue value, um, it's kind of easy to see what's going on when it loads. It's not a quick like this. Okay, so what's happening is um, the X is red and the Y is green, and where they meet in the bottom corner, you get yellow. Isn't that nice? So you get these lovely, beautiful colors. You don't get much of that in the back end, do you? Um, <laughs> lovely, beautiful colors uh, to impress and amaze your friends. Um, but what we want is a rainbow. So, how do you use maths to make a rainbow? Well, we need a couple of functions. The first one is called step, right? And I'd like to, at this point, show you if this works. Oh, no, this controls things in the way. What would change tabs? You can't see it, but I have a Teams thing. Mm -hmm. No, you have the line. Next tab. Look at that. Oh, I said, no, you have to move it out. Why are you <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. I've, I've coped. I'm all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I give it the output. Uh, so the step function basically says, I'm going to take an input, and whenever it reaches a threshold, I'm going to flip from 0 to 1. Right? So the threshold here is 0, and uh, the input is the x coordinate. So here we're proceeding along from minus 5 to um, plus 5 over here somewhere. If I zoom in a little bit. Ooh, this is graph toy, by the way, which is great fun. Um, if I make that like negative 1, it moves across. You get the idea. I hope. Um, I'm going to leave that tab open because it might help me on the next one. So if you actually just make a whole bunch of step functions in Graftoy, you actually get a rainbow because conveniently they all have nice colors. Um, so that's great. The only problem now is I have a whole bunch of functions. I need some way to blend the values together, right? Because otherwise it's not going to work. Um, for that, we need a thing called mix. Let's see how that works. So um, there's our step function again. But I'm going to do it again. But this time, I'm going to, for the threshold, I'm going to stick in the cos uh, value, cos time times 2. Right, test that up a little bit. And I'm still using x as the threshold. So now I get, oh my god, it's laggy on there. OK, it's nice and smooth here. I'll save my way for it. Uh, basically, it's, it's moving with sort of Brownian motion left and right when it updates. Um, then I put in. Uh, a little sign function. Come on, there you are, right? Um, there's no particular reason for this particular function, it's just for prettiness. Um, and a cause function. And what I want to do is I want to mix between the two. So you can see that um, I'm taking one value from one and then, and then the other. And all we do for that is we um, call our mix thing, which basically says value one is function one, value two is function two, and um, the step that we used earlier is our is our mixing point. Okay. Right, let's close all of that in case it's getting very upset. Right, so let's look at the rainbow shader. Hold on. Too enthusiastic with the buttons again. I know we've seen this, but I'm going to show you it again. Um, it's probably quite hard to see on the screen, but one of the things that I've done is, uh, because again, this is my daughter, I've made it softer because it's cuter. 
I'll show you how that works in a moment. Um, so she gets her way with the colors again, as you'll see later. OK, so this is our rainbow shader, right? So it's basically stuff on the top is, is the same as we had before. It's another integral shader, a bit of config, um, setting up the shader itself. Then here we have the actual shader. But instead of just returning a color, we've got a function, rainbow function. Um, function takes a, uh, a floating point, which is our x value, right, going across the screen. Um, and then it sets up, I've done this like the stupidest way I could think of, because there's an awful lot of people out there doing very clever shaders, right? And I just want to just show you that you don't have to do clever shaders, you can do stupid shaders and they still work just fine. They're just not as performant. So um, this is our interval, and then we have a red amount, which is exactly the functions we saw earlier, orange, yellow, green, etc. Then we have, uh, these are um, colors encoded as vector vectors. And then down here I have this heinous mix function, um, where I'm basically mixing them all together in order. So we mix orange and red with the red amount, yellow into that lot with the orange, and so on and so on. And at the end you get um, a, a rainbow. Um, I said at the, bottom, at the end, sorry, earlier on, that I made it softer for cuteness. Uh, the way you do that is you basically say there's a baseline value of 0.3. This is, a, this is like basically every, there's a minimum gray amount, right? And then you add on the color multiplied by 0.7, and you get a slightly brightened version of the uh, softened version of the color. Yeah. Uh, food for thought, yep. Yeah. So, Although the function that we made there was uh, supposed to be going from x across and producing a rainbow, um, nowhere in there does it actually say that the rainbow needs to go in a straight line. Right? All we've really done is said, for a given float, give me the right color for a rainbow. Right? And what that means is you can do other things. Right? And here, she got her way with the colors. Right? So this is a shader. It's one file. It's 130 lines of code. Um, and I'm a terrible shader programmer, but I had a lot of fun making this. Um, I'll quickly, shall I quickly show you the game running? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's going to be slow and laggy, but we'll do it anyway. Um, call it Hoplite, because it's like Hoplite. Um, Okay, so this is it. Wait, wait, hang on. That's it. Not supposed to happen. That's really offensive, isn't it? <laughs> so the idea is all you have to do in this game is get from one corner to the other, and every time you do, you get a lovely echo. Every time you do, you get an extra bad guy. Um, I was quite lucky on that first one. But if I step forward, because if you can see very quickly that this breaks down, because if I step forward now, they're going to kill me. Watch. Oh, I'm dead. But that's okay, it's a rope like, it's supposed to die. So try again. I have to put in a mechanism to allow you to escape. So I step forward now, I'm going to be dead again, right? But if I do this. You know, to teleport and escape. But you can only do it once per level, so you've got to be careful when you use it. Right? Um, and what was really interesting is that um, the game was rubbish for exactly the same reasons as uh, in the ASCII version it was, as it was in this one. I had to put that mechanism in, irrespective of which version of the game you were playing. Right? Um, and the sound effects are there for common value. Right, we're going to stop. Uh, and that's me. Thank you very much. Any questions, or shall I get up? Because we've been here for ages. <laughs> yes. How does it render? Right? Sorry. How's it rendered? How is it rendered? Um, what? Okay. Right there we go. Sorry. How is it rendered? Um, so uh, Indigo is ScarJS using WebGL, WebGL two specifically. It does have a fallback to WebGL, but it's terrible. Um, uh, basically, uh, you describe in lovely friendly, uh, immutable Scala, what you'd like to see on the screen. 
and I do horrible things in the background to talk to the graphics card and set the irrelevant pointers and buffers and stuff to make it work. Uh, so it's all rendered on a GPU. Does that help? So web, WebGL is that based on WebAssembly? Uh, no, WebGL predated WebAssembly. Um, WebGL has been around for donkey's years. WebGL 2 um, has also been around for a while, but um, Apple have only just finished implementing it in, uh, in Safari. Um, and of course, WebGPU is coming. Yeah, so these are basically open standards for um, rendering graphics in browsers, yes. right? Um, they, they give you a lot, right? They are, they're an immense abstraction away from all the hardware and a lot of the details of how it works. And when you look at the difference between WebGL and WebGL2 and so on, what you're really getting is more efficient ways to talk to the graphics card. Because the, the, the problem with graphics program like this is efficiency and speed of, of getting the data to the card so it can do the work. The card, this is 2D pixel art, like 90s games. The cards can choke through this stuff in no time at all. But getting the data to the card efficiently is more challenging. That's the problem. Sorry, I've kind of deviated there. Does that help you? Any other questions? Hello. What functional calls do you make? I remember you made a reference to cosines, the, the mathematical functions, which the Scala compiler understood immediately. Yeah. What functional calls do you make to, to get them out? I can't remember. You made a functional call. I can remember them in C and C++, but I couldn't see that. I've never seen yeah. that at all in Scala. Uh, cosines. cosines. Well, so, so there's, two, um, there's two answers to that. So you can use all completely ordinary Scala math calls and sign and all the rest of it if you want to, that's fine in your main game logic. The, the way ultraviolet works is that it's actually um, shimming onto GLSL. So it's basically pretending to be <coughs> GLSL. And then when, you, when it compiles across to it, it's just calling the real native function, which is heavily optimized in the GPU. Does that help you? You can. I have also, um, ultraviolet also provides kind of full implementations for most of the GLSL functions. So you can actually do and you, can't, you just cannot do this on, on normal GLSL. You can do unit testing <laughs> if you want to. And, uh, and, and crazy modern programming techniques like using imports uh, and stuff like that. Hey. Are there any particular reasons why you use Indigo and Scala to develop a game? Uh, well, Indigo I use because I wrote it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and Scala I use because I like Scala. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a genuinely brilliant language. I, I, my thing with Scala is I'd like to see people doing more things with it. You know, uh, Paul here likes making music with it, which I think is fantastic. But there's, there's a small bunch of people who like, are trying to kind of color outside the lines a bit. We're not just doing backend programming, and I'd like to see more of that in the world. Anybody else? Did your daughter play this game? She did. Uh, she sat on my knee and wouldn't move for 20 minutes. <laughs> that was very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Right. Have you or anyone else been tempted to implement some kind of network? Uh, networking works, yeah. So we support um, web sockets and uh, HTTP based connections. There is another um, open source project called Tyrion. Which so will manage entities for you? Or do you have to do that yourself? Sorry? Like, will it manage entities for you? Will entities. Manage, like, like, to what degree is the networking kind of managing the gameplay for you? Oh, that's up to you. You're the program. Okay, so you can I, still build it yourself. Yeah, yeah, you just, you just fire an event that says connect to a web socket and listen for stuff, and whenever you get an event, you decide what that means. It's nothing more complicated than that. And the, part of the philosophy of the way this thing is built is, um, I've always done, um, Julian recently, Julian Truffaut recently called this uh, shame-driven development. I do the stupidest thing possible and add it to the engine. And then hopefully, somebody will either be really offended by it and help you make it better, or you know, I will make it better because I need, I need it to be better for some actual genuine use case. So a lot of the stuff you can see in Indigo is really simple. Um, some of it is really not.